Unit one, history of sport management. There are many significant events in the history of sport management. You'll see um, a lot of these as we go through class, but these are some major ones. Title IX really helped uh, create equity, not just in sports, but in everyday life. We have the NFL salary cap. And of course, Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier was one of the just major events in Major League Baseball. Management structures. We started out in England. Uh, that's where it all started out. It was originally soccer, cricket, rugby. Sports were for wealthy people in the beginning, uh, especially in England. Leagues started to form. So you have clubs and then you have leagues. Major League Baseball is the first league structure, the National League. <clears throat> and uh, the NFL, NBA, NHL eventually followed suit. And this creates competitive balance. Uh, if you hear in the NFL, they say any given Sunday, that's because uh, the league is really competitively balanced for the most part. And primary theme, structures grow in response to social changes and social issues. I want you to think about that. So leagues will grow in response to social issues. 2010 World Cup, uh, this is just an example. If you look at any um, team such as Real Madrid or teams that are in the English Premier League, look at their roster, okay? It, it's very much a com compilation of people from different countries. Now, early sport management, who gets to play? Really, it's the wealthy. Uh, there was racial segregation and, and a eugenics movement. The start of the club systems, it was in England, and this is the birthplace of sport management. Once these clubs happen, this is the birthplace of sport management. Um, English aristocracy developed exclusive sport clubs with limited membership. You had to have money to join. 19th century, the, uh, the clubs grew as far as standardizing rules, settling disputes, and more organized schedules. Thoroughbred racing. Well, very, very beginning of sport management. In the beginning, no admission was charged. Races were just for entertainment. There was no financial gain involved. But eventually, we needed a more complex system because owners were breeding and trying to train fast horses. Uh, they have an increased complexity of gambling, more gamblers. So you have the gambling, and now you have to make more rules. We have the rail system, better transportation allowed for national competition. And why was gambling so important is because it allowed people to make money and it showed people that they could breed uh, great horses. It allowed them to have more pride. It gave them more pride. Uh, Jockey Club, England, created standardized rules to establish the legitimacy of thoroughbred racing. And this served as a model. Uh, for management practices of different sorts. American horse racing. The American horse racing started out with the three wheel or the, yeah, the wheels on the back. And this is more of a sprint than a four mile race. Think about watching a marathon or watching the 100 meter sprint in the Olympics and you're watching Hussein Bolt. What's more exciting? I mean, to me, it, it'd be the sprint. Uh, and these, these, uh, Horses with the attachment on them, they became a, a better spectator sport. Okay, so um, issues emerge as fixing races. Once the race is fixed and you know somebody cheated, that makes your leagues lack credibility and fan trust. Think about this. Why did the NFL fight so hard to punish Tom Brady? Could it be, what do you think? What do you think? All right. Uh, there was an NBA referee, Tim Donaghy. He fixed games so he could win bets. All right. So the referee gambled. Pete Rose, Hall of Fame. So why did the leagues crack down on this? Just give it some thought. What's worse for leagues? People cheating to win or people cheating to fix outcomes? Definitely cheating to fix outcomes, although they are both bad. But when, say, the Black Sox scandal, we had a pitcher that cheated to lose. Very bad for Major League Baseball.
They're both bad, though. Now we have the modern Olympic Games. These started in 1896, so we're going back to the 1800s. Uh, this, this traces back to at least uh, the 1850, the revival. And Pierre de Coubertin was a big name in sport management. He founded the Olympic Games. And ever, it's, it, it initially was a character building and peace movement through sport. Now, as you know, there's a lot that goes into the Olympic Games and also introduce the amateur Olympic Games. Present day structure, commitment to serve broad membership. Uh, there's international expansion of sports clubs. Clubs organize youth teams and academies, adult recreation leagues and social events. Some clubs are highly competitive, some are more for leisure. We have large memberships and loyal fan bases. Now I want to discuss Augusta National, a uh, male-only golf club. There's only 300 members, and I will show you why. Uh, $40,000 to join, and every year you have to pay $4,000 on top of that. And look at the names here. These are famous people. Lou Holtz, Roger Goodell, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. You get the picture. League system. Uh, baseball, first to adopt the league system and the very first professional team, Cincinnati Red Stockings. Leagues are created to create uniform rules. So all the rules are the same. Everybody abides by the same rules. And some of these rules include gambling restrictions, cleaning up the atmosphere, creating a playoff structure. Other rules from William Holbert, who created the first National League. Uh, Completing schedules. We used to have teams that dropped out because they were losing in the uh, 18, 1900s. Teams would drop out of their league or whatever they were in if they, they didn't think they could compete. So this is one reason that you make teams complete the schedules. Imagine in the NFL if the Giants or Jaguars just said, we're going to quit 2022. We're not doing well. Uh, no beer sales. No betting at the ballpark, player contracts, revenue sharing. So if there's a TV contract, so to speak, the teams will share the revenue. The money made. Characteristics of successful leagues. Consolidated league play. Centralized control. Think about the NFL. A lot of control in the front office. Regulation. We want honest effort, uh, loyal fan support. What else can you think of? For me, I'm thinking of superstars, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, superstars like that. So different league structures. We have the single entity structure, which means a league owns all the teams. So in the MLS, you had the league owned the Seattle Sounders, Philadelphia Union, all those teams. Uh, but that since has faded. Same was with the WNBA, whereas in the NFL, uh, you know, you have Jeffrey Laurie or the Mara family owning teams. The Maras own the Giants, for instance. Now we have professional tournament sports. Those are more individual, golf, tennis. Golf operates upside down. Players have to pay to play. But these golfers make their revenue through endorsements. Think about Tiger Woods. He has Nike and plenty other endorsements, video games. Golf is very dependent on sponsorships and endorsements rather than gate receipts. Look at um, MetLife Stadium. You might fit 80000 in there, right? In a golf gallery for a PGA Tour, there's not that many people standing around the side. It's certainly not 80,000 people. There's restrictions. So they're not making a ton on gate receipts. All right, Fred Cochran, architect of the golf tournament. He created a self-sufficient golf event that pays for itself. The tournament uh, drew very many celebrities, politicians, uh, used athletes to sell advertising space to the public. Uh, another two big names, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope, they created charity tournaments for World War II fundraising. Golf tournaments have evolved in the corporate celebrations, uh, it's a media which people, community, and corporation can buy exposure. 
PGA Tour is a private group that uh, oversees. It's the biggest private group for golfers and uh, a biggest group of professionals. Now we'll look at the Casey Martin case. So Casey Martin, these are things leagues have to, they have challenges. Players uh, need accommodations. For instance, Casey Martin needed accommodation because he had a disability. Uh, he was a golfer with a disability that prevented him from walking the course. So he argued that he should have a golf cart, but the PGA Tour rules don't allow that. He ended up winning this case in court. That's just one example of challenges faced. Heroes and sheroes. So it's not all white males in sports. Uh, it's far from the truth, although there's plenty of work to do. I just saw there's only one African-American head coach in the NFL at this very moment. Uh, so there's just plenty of work to do all over the place as far as making this more equal and, and really getting equality up. We have E.B. Henderson. He was inducted into the National Basketball Hall of Fame. He organized basketball for African-Americans. In 1906, he formed the African American Athletic Conference and laid the groundwork for HBCUs. HBCU is historically black college and university, which is getting very popular now, especially with Deion Sanders, who was coaching at an HBCU. We also have other uh, for instance, Cheney University is uh, in the area. You have Grambling, Howard, a uh, lot of famous HBCU colleges. Effa Manley, Negro Leagues, trans, uh, she helped transform minor and major league baseball. She helped develop all-star games, night games, in inning, uh, between inning entertainment. And that's so important because if your team is not very good, you better have some entertainment somewhere, maybe in between the innings. And Effa Manley helped do this. She's the only woman inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. And we have Phil Knight, uh, founded Nike. Nike is the biggest sport apparel and um, just biggest sporting brand out there right now. Clothing, apparel, and equipment. Billie Jean King. Dominant tennis player, late 60s. She created Battle of the Sexes. She was very instrumental in um, leading the charge for underrepresented groups such as the LGBT uh, and Q group. And U.S. Open Grand Slam event uh, was renamed to Billie Jean King Tennis Center. Matt McCormick started IMG Academy and recognized that athletes need to be paid. Uh, that's another big name in sport management. Okay, we're going to stop this screen share. So if you have any questions, you can email me.